I wanted to share with you my experiences as an archivist for the Maine Maritime Museum, in particular, processing their shipyard records. One of the many challenges an archivist has to confront is finding the order in a collection that comes to them disordered. So I'm going to share with you my practical experiences and the differences between finding order versus creating order. In 2008, uh, I was a processing archivist for the Maine Maritime Museum. This was a contract grant funded position and I processed um, nine maritime collections, manuscript collections. These were captain's letters, captain's papers, and two shipyard records. And then in 2011 and 12, I came in as a project archivist, processed 45 maritime collections, cataloged them and uploaded them to Archon, an online uh, archival database. But in that particular series of collections, I processed the Charles V. Minot shipyard records. And this was uh, about 181 boxes. So the three shipyard records that I processed for the Maine Maritime Museum were the Dunn and Elliott shipyard records, the Percy and Small shipyard records, and the Charles V. Minot shipyard records. So I wanted to say something about um, order versus disorder. So the sanctity of original order is to maintain the order in which collections came in. Uh, the Dunn and Elliott shipyard records and the Percy and Small shipyard record, most of them came in their original order. They came in their filing boxes. So I knew immediately um, that, that the letters were organized a specific way by the creators. That was original order. However, with the Charles V. Minot shipyard records, they did not all come in original order. S some of it did, but most of it was in, in a disarray. So in that case, um, I, had a dis I had disorder, and that would, was disuseful for the researcher. So I would have to create order, try to find that logical order that is better for the user. So the first thing I would do when I would process collections is I would first look at the accession record or accession books and any accompanying materials that I found with, with, with the accession record so I could get as much information as I can about the provenance of the collection and the donor. So the donor information was important too. If the donor was living and I had questions, I would interview the donor. And with the Charles Minot collection, the donor was still living, although she was 86. Uh, she was very, uh, very sharp, and so we interviewed her and found some very useful information about the shipyard records and the shipyard itself. Um, I also asked the curator lots of questions about the the records because the Charles V. Minot uh, shipyard records came to the museum library at different times. So they came in different groupings. That's why they were there's such a disorder. Part of it was already processed by the donor, but a lot of it wasn't. And then I used the resources available at the library. Numerous books on maritime history in Maine. I read books on particular shipyards in Maine, and I also looked at similar collections that were already processed that they had in the archives and, and the finding aids themselves. That was very helpful. So once I did that, I was now ready to survey the collection. Survey is just a fancy way of saying inventory. I'd have a notepad and a pencil, and I would go through the whole collection, and I would notate anything um, of interest with the collection. I would um, try to find the patterns or the similarities in documents so I could see how I was going to group certain documents into series. So the whole process of surveying the collection was to determine the extent and scope of the collection. I didn't organize it. I was just, you know, inventorying the collection. That was very important. So once I was done doing that, I had a pretty good idea of how the collection needed to be arranged. So what is the purpose of arranging the collection? and how to find or create the order uh, when you get a disordered collection. So the whole purpose of the arrangement is to restore or establish the files as closely as possible to the order in which they were kept by the creator. So in this case, um, I was just trying to f arrange them as close as possible to how they originally were arranged because they were all in some disarray. I need to find the evidence of how the files were used by the creator and why they were created, that's helpful. But at the same time, I had to respect the integrity or the basic structure of the collection and 
the consideration for those who will use the materials. So with the Dun & Elliot and Percy and Small, most of that was already in its original order. So that's, that's what I call finding the order. With the Charles V. Minit shipyard records, in many cases I had to create the order that was trying to find the logical order. So here's our basic structure of business records. And business records follow a hierarchical model. So on the left, I have the Northeastern University New England College Pharmacy. I got this off their website. Their college archives have this hierarchy where the most important records are at the beginning. So the corporation and board of trustees, and then the office of the dean, office of admissions and enrollment, and so forth. Same thing with Wellesley College Archives. I went on their website, and I looked at their order. So that also, the most important record is on top, moving on down. And... They even, I even quoted what they had on their website about their archives. They, their collections are organized into a classification scheme based on Wellesley College administrative hierarchy. So that makes sense. Now, the Charles V. Minus sh shipyards also had its own hierarchy. And we had two groups. We grouped them, in, um, we had two separate groups in the Charles uh, shipyard records, the Minus shipyard records. The first group were just the company records. And these would have uh, their correspondences. We didn't have board minutes or incorporation. The correspondences, the business letters, were very important because the communication between the ship owners and builders and brokers and, and uh, all those who had interest in the shipyard were in there. So you can get a very good idea of what was going on the day-to-day -day business of the shipyard in those correspondences. So they were first. Then the insurance um, contracts to maintain the yard was next. Then financial records, usually general business, invoices, things they purchased for the yard. And then the payroll books to pay the workmen who worked in the yards. And then the vessel papers, they were actually separate from the company records. And they were organized, um, they were grouped by individual vessels. And within each individual vessel was a hierarchy. So you'd have your ownership and registration papers right on top and then insurance, construction, correspondence accounts, and then so forth. So looking at this kind of condensed version of the hierarchy, the one thing I noticed uh, that was different in the company records versus the vessel papers were how the correspondence were organized. When I processed Dun & Elliot and Percy and Small, the correspondences, the, the general business letters in the company records were organized alphabetically by the company name and then within each you know folder would be in reverse chronological order um, and particularly the Dun and Elliot record they came in two large filing boxes and then four original transfer file boxes so that particular collection was um, was in the possession of a maritime historian and he had gone through the two large file boxes organizing letters invoices and dividend books by a particular vessel so there was no way of knowing the original order there, although that was that was a standard logical organization that historians would usually do with vessel papers. But when it came to the business records, those four transfer file boxes were in their original order, and they were in alphabetical by business name, and then chronological um, after that. What was interesting is that the order of the letters in each of the photos were in reverse chronological, with the most current on top. Now, I could have left them that way, but I did impose a chronological order instead. I followed a normal order with the earliest to the latest date. And this would follow the correspondence by true creation date and kind of shows the evolution or history of each business and the relationship they had with the ship owners. So I do want to say that when I would impose an order, I always documented any changes I made in the collection and my rationale. That's very, very important. Now the type of correspondence um, that I would find with the vessel papers is very different from the company records. Um, the kind of letters that were in the vessel papers were general correspondences to the ship owner having an interest in the vessel they were building and then captain's letters. So initially I thought that maybe I should also alphabetize the captain's letters as well. 
in my survey of the collection, captain's letters are usually grouped together. Um, but I don't know how they organize them in their filing system. So that's why I was thinking, should I do it the same as the company records? But I realized that it may be better and it made more sense to me to organize them by um, who the first captain was and then the second captain, then the third captain. It was not unusual for a vessel to have multiple captains throughout its life. So that is what I did instead. I actually organized them um, after putting all the general correspondence in a group in chronological order. I then grouped the captain's letters, putting the first captain of the vessel right up, right up, to, right on top, Captain E. T. Jones, and then these are just examples I'm using here. And the next captain, the second captain, would be like Captain Abbott. And you see, it's not alphabetical order; it's chronological by who the first captain was and second captain was, third, fourth, and so forth. To me, that was a logical order. Um, it's not. It's not the same as finding the order. I created this order, but I really believe that sometimes the archivist has to recognize the evidential authority of those documents uh, instead of saying, well, it should be the way the secretary filed it. I just feel that uh, sometimes we have to impose an order uh, for the ease of use for the, for the researchers. So now this is actually the standardized arrangement of our vessel papers. Every vessel has its records organized in this manner. Um, is this an original order? Somewhat based on how other shipyard records came into the archives, but maybe not 100%. Um, some of it had to be create, created uh, because we always are thinking about how the users use these collections. So some of the order was rearranged to make them more usable, like a practical use. The general accounts uh, uh, series is is the most challenging. This is we had probably hundred thousands of invoices, and not all of them were in order. So when I surveyed the collection and I was going through all these invoices, I was kind of thinking in my head, maybe I should put these in chronological order. That was my first thought, you know, by creation date. But I was finding that as I was going along the survey, I started finding these invoices bundled. And they were wrapped with papers, and on the papers would be uh, a, uh, the name of, a name of a port and then a date range. Sometimes it had the captain's name on the, the wrapper, uh, but all the invoices would have a captain's name. So, you know, it wasn't really necessary for the captain to put his name. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. And what they were showing is that it was giving me an understanding of where that vessel was during that time period. And these invoices were grouped in this way, indicating the culmination of a voyage and the costs incurred during their travels. So the invoices were originally organized by trips. So that was actually the correct order. And then I realized that this is how I should be organizing those. See, the captains would pay for all the expenses when they got the port, including the wages. And then they would bundle up their receipts and their invoices, and they would give them to the ship broker at that port, who then would reimburse the captain. So by arranging the invoices by the ports, the users could follow the vessels, uh, the life cycle of the vessel, and see where that vessel has gone. And that made logical sense. And in fact, that truly is the original order of those invoices, and that's how I organized them. Now remember when I said sometimes the order is rearranged? Well, here's something that um, has been done at the Maine Maritime Museum, um, and it's con they continue to do so. The charter parties, the freight and cargo, like the bill of ladings, the freight list, some crewmen wages, and slop accounts, they would be bundled up in those, those wrappings, but it was determined to, to pull them out and group them together. Um, now this is an imposed arrangement again, but it was imposed deliberately for the benefit of the maritime historians and the kind of research they did. A lot of times they come in and they say, I want to see where that vessel went. I don't want to go through the invoices. I want to look at the charter parties. 
And if you had, if you were lucky enough to have all the charter parties for a particular vessel, you could see where that vessel went from the beginning of its voyage, you know, this beginning of its life until they sold that vessel or that vessel, you know, sank at sea. Um, a lot of times they were just interested in what crewmen were making. And so they just wanted to see the, the wages and only the wages. Uh, a lot of researchers were only interested in, the, in, the, in what crewmen were doing. So these were actually pulled out deliberately. And it's, it, it may seem that it's the wrong thing to do, but as an archivist, I see the logic in this. And there's a, there's a quote in the Frank Bowles. He's an archivist who's an expert in selecting and appraise, appraising um, records. And in a paper he wrote, Disrespecting Original Order, he talked about the challenge of original order, especially when the collection comes disordered. He says, when a filing scheme imposed on documents by the creator proves unworkable, it becomes legitimate for the archivist to destroy the original order insofar as it is necessary to ensure that the evidentially superior documents may be successfully used. I, and that's how I see, I see this as. So just to recap, every record collection is unique. It's important to apply your archival theory to protect provenance and the sanctity of order. Um, try to find the original order, uh, but sometimes disorder makes that difficult, so you must create a logical order from disorder. Always survey your collection before ranging, ranging in any order and use the resources around you. So I hope that this helped a little bit as you go to your internships and start uh, surveying and processing your records.